I think a green screen would be kind of fun, though. Like, could you imagine, like, if you use that, say, if you were doing a D and D campaign? Oh yeah, like, that'd be epic. Man. You're running your you online stuff. stuff and just, I got one right yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> why, you, why you we, that we, we could be in the ocean right now. <laughs> I have nothing to hang it up on. <laughs> the ocean would be great for the upcoming One Piece campaign. I could there be you DMing, go. and you could see the waves, and then I could set the weather to set the Look, tone. You could you set know? it up better than I can with the sheets you got behind you already. Listen, I am a master of sheets. Like you know, linens. <laughs> You put those in the, you know, you separate them from the other parts of your laundry. You get that, like, fabric softener, the dryer sheets. Good to go. Like, I've been hanging sheets up for podcasting stuff since I lived in public <laughs> housing. And that was the, my first attempt at a podcast was the most ghetto thing you'd ever see. And I was very proud of how ghetto it looked. Yeah, 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 we've all seen the ghetto recording setups, people's closets. Dude, I used to work at a hospital. I would take foam things from the hospital that they were throwing out because uh, everything in a hospital is medical waste. So people would just like throw thing, perfectly good stuff, like not even used once. Oh, well, it was in a room. You got to toss it now. And I'm like, hey, this foam right here would be really good. So, like, I had this uh, stair railing, and I'd be stuffing all the foam uh, in the little gaps in between. And it's just like, okay, there, that's soundproofing. And then I had a dog <laughs> line, and I hung a sheet on that, then ran up the stairs and hooked the other end of the dog line to a closet door. If being a DM has te- taught you anything, it's imp- improvisation. How do you say it? Absolutely. Uh, like, yeah, you improv. need to know the velocity of a cow if it's like thrown yeah. it. No, Honestly, <laughs> I, I need to know all the logistics of cow trebuchets every day. It, it's very <laughs> deeply important to me. Like every time my players come up with something crazy, it's like, okay, hold on. I might have failed that one math class in high school, but math brain is kicking into full gear, people. Look, we've all heard the the famous horse stacking, and it can be done. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Like, I loved physics in school. That was one of my best subjects. My physics teacher was like traumatized when I was going off to art college. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I love it. I love it when those kind of topics come up in the game. It's like, okay, so I want to launch this cow. How far can it go? Like, if I'm sending it with this amount of force, I'm like, okay, I can do it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a uh, great time to start the show. <laughs> oh, let's see if I hit the right button. Hey. <laughs> hey. Welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, and physics. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Welcome back to another episode. Happy November, right? Turkey time, right? We're out of, uh, out of the You know, in days. some parts of the world, I mean, that is debatable. But, you know, speaking of other parts of the world, we have a amazing guest with us today. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, sure our, yeah I'm sure our <laughs> listeners were like, what? Who's, whose beautiful voice is that? Oh, my God. Oh, some Tulsa <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Gabriel Galway, and uh, I run the YouTube channel, The Ugly Goblin. Uh, that's me. <laughs> I'm, I'm in Finland Boston. as well. Speaking of other side of the world, I'm currently living in Finland. I'm an Irish man lost in northern Finland. That's me. That <laughs> sounds like long. a plot to an amazing book. What a place to get lost in, though. Oh, lost, <laughs> lost in my partner's eyes. She dragged me over here. She's a, she's a siren. I was like, yes, I will live in the Arctic <laughs> wastes of uh, northern <laughs> Finland. Sounds good. <laughs> A Viking s- siren right there. That, that, that's all I think. Like you, you, you say Norway, I'm thinking big, strong Viking women. And, and I mean, what's more attractive than a woman that can kick your ass? <laughs> Sorry, you try. I wonder, look it up. I wonder if like the, the Scandinavian like Viking culture had siren in there. Oh, they, they were sailors. They must have. Yeah, I will. 
They got what if they had like their own kind of like you know how they have like the oh they do uh, Nixies. So like, oh Nixies. <laughs> I've yeah, heard yeah. of Nixies before actually. Yeah. Oh, Are they like yeah. heavy metal sirens then? Did they just say <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny? Yeah, they were types of river mermen and mermaid who may lure men into drowning, like the Scandinavian type akin to the Celtic, yeah. Melsune, and similar to the Greek sirens. Interesting. They they were in the Spider Spider guidebook, I think. Oh yeah, I, I think, think they were. were. I don't know if you read. Uh, you Spider-Man. know what? You're right. And now yeah. that I think about it, yeah, I, I remember that specifically. And they're very similar to Kelpies as well. I think Kel- Kelpies yeah. did an Irish episode Irish on Kelpies. <laughs> did I think I remember that. Kelpies. I think I heard that. Yeah, Kelpies. Probably really haven't, cool. haven't done one on sirens yet. They're cool. They're cool. Mm. That that is something we need to tackle one of these days. All the sirens. It might be even good a good Valentine Day uh, episode. Oh yeah, like True. yeah. The, who can resist the seductive allure of your girlfriend needing uh, attention? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got not, not at all anything other than seductive. No, no, no. Of course not. We were wholesome. Oh, this <laughs> we had our obligatory horny episodes a few months ago. <laughs> Gotta have a break and then come back to them. Exactly. We need a real kids, like... big degenerate for that episode. Like, I don't know who we would find to maximize degeneracy, but trust and believe we got to. I mean, look, we I did Arachne. That was one. We did Succubus, I think. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> <laughs> get, uh, get Sam from Critical Role. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> now that would be a guest. Oh man! Speaking I of Critical like Role, I watched of their uh, episode this week, and oh man, <laughs> I don't want to give spoilers to anyone else who watches Critical Role. But I'm like... far behind. I'm pretty far behind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I started my new. I started a job recently, so I'm going to be catching up. Apparently. Hey, now's the time. I, I'm adoring the uh, Worlds Beyond Number. Um, Brendan Lee Mulligan, Bria Eingar, Lou Wilson, and uh, 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 Erica Ishii. And right. four of them have got a, a kind of podcast campaign on uh, Spotify. It's, it's so good. Oh, nice. It's good. I've always been a big fan of tabletop escapades. I think it's one of those lesser known ones, but it's just really good. They keep the uh, camp, the party size small, and it kind of set the tone for me when it came to D and D podcast. Because when you have more than four players, like, y- y- you lost me. That's too many voices. Yeah, yeah, planning anything, and both the games and the plans in the games themselves <laughs> just take up uh, hours and hours of game time. But, yeah. yeah, it gets to be a lot. But speaking of a lot, I understand that your channel has been really blowing up lately. Yeah, no, it's wild. Uh, I was just saying, it's, uh, I think it was about a month ago, I was at about 200 followers. And I'm at 2,000. I've gained another 2,000 now in, the, in a month, which is mm. no, it's, it's really, really fast. Um, Damn, let this man cook. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the pod. Uh, no, it, it, it's it's wild. Yeah, it's it's, it's really fun, and, and people are so nice. That's the thing as well. Like I I hadn't originally gotten a lot of the oh, actually comments, um, mm. especially I tried to do a like kind of spoof take on like how to break Baldur's Gate, but it was like everything was wrong in it. And it just I think it made everyone angry, and I think that I got a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> but now people are so awesome. It's like oh wow, this is so good. Wow, this is so nice. I can do stuff. Right? I'm like oh my god, you guys are so nice. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, the people like the people we've met have been so cool and so kind. To us. They've mm. all been you know pretty supportive and you know pretty eager to work with us. And, you know, oh, it's it's and just. Hang out. Yeah, it means so much. Like I was expecting to be dealing with real, real uh, tough comments through this whole thing, but I, it just <laughs> warms my heart there. Where I'm like, hey, I actually really like what you do. I'm like, oh, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the community at large, it, for the most part, unless you dive into Reddit, big mistake going to Reddit. <laughs> yeah, that's your own fault. Uh, for for the most part, the, the community is pretty supportive. But yeah, yeah. like as soon as you get into those Reddit comments, it's like, oh, your your DM didn't agree <laughs> with what your you had in mind for your character. You should leave that campaign right now. Yeah, I used to play like competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, and uh, God, it was cutthroat. 
like when I first showed up, like, like my very first tournament, I was torn to shreds by people just like, you haven't even got card sleeves? What the hell? I was like, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't know what it is. And like every, because it's a competitive <laughs> game, uh, everyone is a little more, you know, competitive. But with D&D, it's a collaborative game. So when I started, mm -hmm. I started going to like AL and everyone was like dad's thing. They were all just so wholesome and like welcoming. I was like, oh my God, this is so much better. Why, why it really is this? like that. I mean, some of the yeah. most wholesome people I know I've met through the hobby. Yeah. All my, all my friends. <laughs> just <laughs> all my best friends are from d, &D. Honestly, my... that's how you build them deep connections. I mean, uh, what's bigger than the intimacy that comes from sharing a imagination together i mean that that really is like a, it's a mind meld of an experience because it's not enough for you to play pretend on your own no you got other people playing pretend with you and exactly. i think that's yeah, how theater kids kind of develop those deep bonds in high school you know yeah i mean you know it's essentially like you're you know creating like a trauma bond you know? yeah you're, you're living out the experience as well that's the, that's the other side of it like when you talk yeah. about the games you're not like you remember when your character did that you're like no remember when we killed the dragon that was epic mm -hmm. and i threw my Absolutely. sword to you and you like caught it and so you when you remember it it's a it's a core memory it's like you were in that moment and you mm -hmm. went through these really intense things just exactly like when we talk about campaigns campaign finds its roots in the war gaming history of the hobby yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is stronger than the bonds of brothers in arms, you know? Yeah. 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 It's like, hey, I got the, had this old D&D &D buddy back in the day. He's like, we haven't talked in years. Yeah. You, you, you meet up for the first time and it's like as if nothing has changed. Yeah. I can't wait to have uh, kids one day and be able to tell them about all these like crazy things I've done with my friends and they're like, Oh, really? Yeah. And then what did the illithid do? I'm like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Tell them how we survived, like the movie 2012. <laughs> it's wild. That was really it's happened, like, man. I, yeah, yeah. I let my daughter play D&D, &D, and her first session, she's like, okay, I'm going to climb up in the tree. Okay, and for this, I'm going to jump on the back of this baby dragon, and I'm going to stab it in the neck and just shank it. And I'm just like, damn, you're five. <laughs> Calm down. Yeah, you see other sides of kids when they play D and D. It's it's intense. <laughs> they up the ante, dude. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. I've run, I've run campaigns. Everything it seems like is like you know sucking up a life, like you know, especially for kids, like they're growing up so fast. Yeah, yeah. in yeah. all the wrong ways. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's they got a screen, you know, in their face, and they're not paying attention to the world around them, but they're like suffocating their imagination with social media. Like it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, I was just looking at, um, the statistics, uh, at one stage, I can't remember when for the life of me, when this, uh, these tests were being done, but, but they, basically they were looking for like, uh, geniuses. And so they mm -hmm. did tests on like young kids and they found like 98% of these young kids were geniuses. They showed the qualities mm -hmm. of geniuses. They did it again like later on and only something like 50 percent were geniuses and then they went to like yeah. teenagers it went all the way down to like two percent so they went from 98 <laughs> right. to two after going through school which is uh right. education is important but also <laughs> I i've heard lots of very intelligent people like michio kaku or adam savage i think mm -hmm. who have said things along the lines of school just kind of beats the want the need to learn and be better out of kids you know what i mean yeah 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 it's, i mean people talk about how like school's not a competition but like it literally is isn't it like the whole idea of like bit, you being in like the gifted programs or being in the ap classes or like, yeah yeah and it puts that like natural competitism on people like the pressure mm -hmm. you have to succeed in this to succeed in everything yeah. He was like, sometimes you just want to go home and like be a dude that fights dragons. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <has> that. <laughs> I think that every school would be better if they had just not a table gaming per se program. Like maybe that'd be perfectly fine. I think that there's, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of benefits that come with card games too. Yeah. But if every school Absolutely. had a, a table gaming club that had some D and D uh, or something of the like, and like some card games or whatever. 
we'd be a lot better off as a society because all these kids are able to compartmentalize and imagine being in different situations. That is yes, straight yeah. stimulation, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah people absolutely. are lacking that perspective. Like, mm-hmm. And I feel like D&D specifically is like, not only are you living in like the perspective you've created, like mm-hmm. you're forced to experience everyone else's perspective. Yeah, yeah, you've got to be, you've got to take everyone else into consideration when you do things in D&D. It's not a solo thing. And so many things in life are like, they put you on the one track. You've got to, you're doing your thing and that's it. It doesn't affect anyone else. But it's, it's, I love just collaborative games. I love improvised games. Board games in general, just any kind of game is my favorite way to get to know people. Because like, all the walls come down. You see like who people really are when you play games with them. Uh, it's my favorite way to, uh, to socialize. We've talked I a lot about absolutely agree. Mental, yeah, about the mental like health effect that D and D can have on people. Oh. So I mean, especially for kids, like get your kids into tabletop games or you know role playing games in general. Like it, it's fantastic. It's good for bonding. But one thing that I find that a underutilized tool is that a lot of people think that like say in the political sphere for example that they can't really agree on things or get along but like once you get into like a lot of people outsource their opinions and thoughts on things in general mm-hmm. so with D in the very much the same way you can get people to think and rationalize why they think something and they can mm-hmm. do that through their character so as the dm all you have to do is ask the questions and that's the intrinsically the role of the dm hey yeah. you're in this situation what do you do oh you're doing that why are you doing that okay yeah. maybe an npc asks a question and all of a sudden it's on your player that they have to walk themselves through the process they have to think about why they think the way that they think yeah. and yeah. sometimes they find that they don't actually believe what they say they believe now yeah. that can be a, a way of crit enhancing critical thinking for the person outside of the game. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't endorse bringing politics to the table whatsoever, but I, I always endorse growing critical thinking skills. Yeah. You know, another thing is like, this definitely, you know, along the lines of what you're saying, it teaches like emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. being able to to work through your emotions and recognize what not just you feel, but like your character is feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes so like, it's even easier that way. Yeah, and it's a safe space too where you can yeah. do that. And like you're slightly detached from your character, so you can experience it through them. Like I've found mm-hmm. like I've had characters that I've made and they've just been become absorbed over the years. Like, you know, you might have this one character that you want to explore with that character. And you're like, you're not sure if you can be say like you say you have a confident bar and stuff, and you're not very confident, but you get to be confident through them and over time. You just you just merge and then you just find yeah. you, you have that confidence and it's an amazing tool for that you just get to attach all these different parts to yourself and it's like a it's little exactly. training exactly it's, it's very cool yeah yeah i mean it's kind of like the like classic christians have the what would jesus do or like maybe you want to learn to be financially responsible you could ask yourself what would hank hill do you know like a, <laughs> what would right, insert right. yeah what would insert character here do in this situation And that extends to the characters you create. And I've met a few people that have benefited from, I would do things this way, but my character would do this differently. So if you ask yourself, what would your character do? That might very well give you an answer because you're thinking differently entirely because your character has a completely different thought process, typically. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool space. So Sam, what do you got for us this week? Oh, all right. So today I thought would be kind of an interesting time to go back into our dragon, you know, discussions. Oh, I miss those. Instead, we got yeah, dungeons yeah. and dragons, but not nearly <laughs> enough of the ladder. I think our I think our last one was on purple dragons. So oh, nice. um, yeah, we've kind of been skirting the edges, you know. We've done like Drakes, I believe. I think we did one on Wyverns, I think. Yeah. So we're kind yeah, of skirting the edges. Slowly edge bringing it, man. <laughs> so I thought, why not go to the roots in the very beginning of the Eo Dracos and the Proto Dragons? Absolutely. Then I would just kick my ass. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, what are the Eo Dracos, right? Or what are Proto Dragons? 
Dragons. The Eel Dracos, or the Dawn Dragons in a dead language, was a genus of prehistoric proto-dragons. And proto-dragons were supposedly the first kind of species of dragons that appeared on, you know, the primordial soup of Toro. You know what I mean? Like, during the forming processes and all that kind of shit. Education time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got kind of a, not a lot, but it's it's a lot of like it. It reminds me a lot of talking about like evolution theory, you know, mm-hmm. and not to bring in like religion stuff, but for the sake of like these evolved, you know, these were the root of all the different kinds of dragons we have now, mm-hmm. you know. I love this stuff. I eat this stuff up. We're like a family tree. It's so cool. A lore is just fun, you know? I love it so much. (laughs) According to information taken from an incomplete fossil evidence, Eodracos were similar in form and appearance to present age wyverns. With an average length of 35 feet, 10 meters, and 50 foot, 15 meters wingspan. No evidence suggesting Eodracos had a stinger on its tail like wyverns. Due to the size of its skull, it was also believed that their brains were smaller than those of wyverns, making them less intelligent than those creatures. And we all know wyverns are basically animals, right? Yeah. (laughs) But they were uh, larger than that of dinosaurs. So maybe making them a little bit more, you know, a little bit more cunning, but not exactly intelligent. Um, It was believed by the scholars from Candlekeep that proto-dragons were related to the prehistoric dinosaurs, and it was speculated that maybe they were a divergent offshoot. The first known proto-dragons were believed to be the Aeo Dracos. Wyvern-like creatures considered non-intelligent were more cunning than normal animals. Aeo Dracos were able to survive the cataclysm that destroyed most of the dinosaur species, believed by most to be the Tearfall, uh, which is... I believe it was essentially like, you know, the dinosaur extinction, like a meteor or something like that, but like, yeah. worse. <laughs> Much worse. <scary. laughs> How do you get if worse? You to take out a bunch of dragons, you gotta have something bigger yeah. than a meteor. Like, the planet got, like, obliterated in the god. Did they kill the horseshoe moved. crabs, too? Because those motherfuckers survive all kinds <laughs> <Yeah>. of shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I tried to, like, Go back and I was like, okay, so what's the tear fall? Then I was like, so what the hell is this? The days of thunder? What the? The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> the days of thunder? It was, a bunch of, it was a rabbit hole like no other. <laughs> so, so my, uh, my homebrew world is, is called Gothstar, but it was originally called a God's Tear or God's Tear. So it was kind of cool. I'm like, yeah, I, I totally <laughs> need to, meant to make that match up there. It's <laughs> so a lot of these scholars believe that after the tear fall, uh, it created a situation where the proto dragons had to rapidly evolve over, you know, a few thousand years. Where they were kind of, you know, forced to exist within this like chaotic, like gods of primordials are going crazy. Like, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> right. fossil evidence also suggested the existence of winged, multi headed proto dragons and believed many of those were the ancestors of hydras and other multi headed reptiles. I'll buy into um, that. Yeah. So they believe that the uh, evolution that spanned these thousands of years spawned a lot of the proto-draconic species, such as wyverns, drakes, and pseudo-dragons. So looking at the... I think I can send you this picture, actually, if you want to put it up on the thing. All right. Uh, give me a second. Apologize if you heard scratching there earlier. I've got a, a restless puppy running around. Oh, <laughs> oh it, it could be a, a whole lot worse. <laughs> only tree. Give you like a visual. Oh, wow. That's cool. So, yeah. So, looking at the top, we have the Eo Dracos here. And then we have the multi headed dragons, believed to be, you know, the Hydra descendants, wyverns, uh, fairy dragons, pseudo dragons, and drakes. And then we get into the you know metallic and the chromatic kind of histories, starting with the Igni Draco, which is I believe was kind of just like a larger and a little more intelligent version of the Eo Draco, and then they kind of started to take on the specific characteristics with the Pharaoh Dracos and the Infisi Dracos, um, with the Pharaohs becoming the metallics and the others becoming the chromatics. Cool. 
Which is, I think it's really cool. The Pharaoh Draco. That sounds fucking sick. Yeah. No, still, I, the D and D science is just that. I love this kind of stuff. It's like, oh yeah, give me some evolution. Then, you know, they they look at it and they're like, well, what about the ones that don't really fit? This is know, so wide. Normal, iconic <laughs> theme. Yeah. And then they like they're like, what about the Oriental dragons? You know, were they descendants of Eo Dracos too? So then they're like, ah, oh, well, there must be you know some kind of you know. <laughs> Uh, link so they have the eo draco orientalis mm, which i cool. think are really cool <laughs> you know those are the long serpentine like chinese dragons. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, like the this really makes a lot of sense when you look at it yeah, oh, yeah. and i like when you look at it you know you look at the eo draco line you go down to like drakes it makes sense why they're kind of like in their own little tree because you know, they're not true dragons oh. like the igni draco line and then you I have like, like the, the pharaoh dragon, pharaoh dragon <laughs> like the pharaoh draco that because that, that makes me think like pharaoh magnetic mm -hmm. so it's like yeah could, yeah, the, could right. these dragons have magnetic abilities magneto <laughs> dragons <laughs> or am i in danger <laughs> yeah that's like yeah, some yeah. latent power that they've had all this time you get all these magneto dragons going around Oh god <laughs> <laughs> magneto that shit's good write that down write that down <laughs> i'm writing it down right <laughs> So like I said before, you know, <laughs> due to the harsh climatic changes Toro experienced in the final years of the Days of Thunder, which was essentially the post-Ice Age era, right after this cataclysmic event, um, <laughs> apparently the Days of Thunder was caused by uh, Dendar the Night Serpent. I think I talked about him a little bit in our Far Realms video or episode. Um, I believe a the... brief mention, yes. Mm -hmm. like, there's yeah, just Dendar so was a... There. Yeah, it was a, like a whispered one, I believe, one of the old, you know, old gods who was essentially kind of claimed to be devouring the sun and starting the age of the shadow epoch where the gods and the primordials essentially fought over the uh, world. That must have been a time before sun dragons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So this shit sounds crazy. So we have proto dragons <laughs> showing up. And then we have, you know, the cataclysmic event that kind of wiped out most of them, forced them to rapidly evolve and create this family tree. And then you have the Days of Thunder after, I guess, <laughs> from this ice age caused by this god creature eating the sun <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and the gods and primordials are like, oh, free real estate. <laughs> real estate <laughs> that's crazy like you know, the you know the way some creatures have to like adapt to like super intense environments yeah. like this is why dragons are as strong as they are they right. survived exactly. all of this <laughs> and exactly. i think that's kind of the point there too it's <laughs> only like, the fittest why they have to rapidly like change why there's so many mm -hmm. Why they're so they're able to gain so much power. It's interesting. So scholars theorize the Eo Dracos rapidly evolved into two main genera, one of which was fairly similar in nature with dinosaurs and believed to be extinct. Other named the Igni Draco, like I said earlier, they had the ability to breathe out blasts of fire. It was also believed the Igni Dracos were actually intelligent and self aware creatures. Some scholars attributed to them the creation of the draconic language. Hmm. Although scholars were unsure how and why it happened, it was believed it was believed that the Igni Dracos evolved further into another two uh, genera in in Fisi Draco, believed to be the ancestors of chromatic dragons, and the Pharaoh Draco, believed to be the ancestors of metallic dragons. Both genera continued to undergo processes of rapid evolution till they evolved into the members of species known as the true dragons. Hmm. Yeah, the true dragons. Cool. Yeah. And last but not least, here th apparently there is some, uh, some controversy with this theory of, uh, you know, like I said a little bit earlier, the evolution, you know, mm -hmm. and <laughs> this kind of sparked, you know, the idea in my mind, kind of unlocked a memory when I was a kid of watching one of these, uh, you know, History Channel shows mm -hmm. about dragons, and then being like, you know, what if dinosaurs are just dragons? <laughs> and like I remember being a kid and I loved Dragon Zoo. Like I had one of those big books, like the Dragon Lore. I could tell you, you know, everything about that was awesome. Yeah, the Dragonology and, book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the Dragon Yeah, the one they sell at the book the store. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. And you know, I think about that all the time and I'm like, you know, they're always like learning more things about dinosaurs, like now they're feathers and 
now they have you know hollow bones and shit like that mm -hmm. like they were bigger than we thought like what what if they were dragons you know what i mean like yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who would really know like, i mean they're like in yeah. in every culture all over the world yeah. it's like they, yeah. there's got to be something there <laughs> and you yeah. know what they find like you know don't tell the smithsonian but they find you know bones of giants and shit right and like Especially yeah. in, you know, Ireland and like the Scotland areas, they yeah, find them yeah. all the time. And I'm like, I, I heard they found a bunch <laughs> in like uh, the far out in the west, like Death Valley area. Yeah. And like these things are like coming to light and it's, like, it's going to be harder and harder to to hide it if it is true that like, <laughs> oh, these dinosaurs had giant wings, bro. Like <laughs> yeah, we, we missed that, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, uh, the oh, tiny yeah. T-Rex arms are actually no. just like, the of, like, these massive wings. Of yeah. Their, <laughs> their heads are on backwards. Right. Who knows? <laughs> I like but to imagine it, it was just some uh, madman just a just uh, taking Da Vinci-style wings and just strapping them to these giant-ass <laughs> lizards. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, look <laughs> out, there's a flying dragon! <laughs> but they're out here, like, trying to resurrect them like it's a damn Jurassic Park movie. But what if they, like, Put the bad boy in like an egg, you know, they got the test tubes going, whatever. The hatches so are like, oh, look at this little velociraptor. <laughs> Suddenly it's breathing fire and shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They try to do uh, like a, sorry, the target target. <laughs> they try to do <laughs> like uh, Jurassic Park on it and they don't turn yeah. out to be dinosaurs at all. They're like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, 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 God. <laughs> <laughs> we, we saw the skeleton we didn't we didn't realize that the rest of it was actually made out of something else entirely yeah, what do you mean that the, the wings don't have cartilage or bone it's all muscle yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that like then that makes me think about like what if we had you know the same kind of evolutionary deal you know we went through like the primordial soup the cataclysm of the dinosaurs like what if they were forced to rapidly evolve and like gain the ability to like live within the hearth and then like the hollow earth theory starts going crazy you know what I mean? dude i don't know if i believe in hollow earth but oh, i desperately want to because yeah, it just it's sounds so cool, so cool. Um, anyway <laughs> <Very cool. laughs> so, as a group of these theories came to be known it wasn't widely accepted by most scholars Experts in draconic creatures, prominent among them who were shunned the evolutionist theory, in favor for the simple but most widely accepted explanation of the gods as the creator of the mortal races, right? They think <laughs> they're shunning evolution in D&D. &D. <laughs> Yeah, they think <laughs> dragons came from somewhere else. They were created by the gods, blah, blah, blah. Right? Nice. The popular theory was to point out that the existence of dragons of similar races to those found in Toro and other places, crystal spheres, worlds, and even the outer planes. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> this counter theory, however, was countered by supporters of the proto-dragon theory by pointing out that not only in Toro, but also in many other worlds, there was enough fossil evidence to prove the existence of the proto-dragon species. The fact that proto-dragon fossils exist in worlds beyond Toro may have existed into the same races of dragons Tortillian proto-dragons did. Oh, Torillian. I see. Created more controversy as well. I like the, the idea theory. of fossils in D and D because, like, it's, imagine you're yeah. on an expedition, but the treasure you find is a fucking proto dragon fossil. Like, <laughs> yeah. how many like the, parties have the archaeologists? Well, yeah, you just Blatant, like that. magic in these like fossils and bones would be really cool. Yeah, Ooh, that's, that's, that's ancient epic. magic in ancient fossil bones. Yeah. Like talk about like draconic bloodline. You find an ancestor of the draconic like race. That's, oh. that's pretty cool. Like, cause cause D and D has everything. It's got dinosaurs. It's got all yeah. of them. It's like so you don't think of putting fossils in there. It's like oh yeah, there's even cooler yeah. things that used to exist. Right. It's it's fucking no. big ass leviathan skeleton. Like, <laughs> so dude, cool. wait a minute. That's a great big bad kind of uh, thing. Very Everyone cool. loves liches, but what if the lich was an archaeologist? Oh, oh, oh man, that's so. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm stealing. Yes. That. I'm sorry. That's really gotta, cool. Gotta, <laughs> talk about liches like creating like skeletal creatures. What if it's like go find them? <laughs> yeah, like, cool. and I would imagine that the biggest treasure for a lich, like, they have the party. 
go with a low class archaeologist and he goes and into like the depths of a part of the world like say Chult for example and they find this ancient proto dragon far more powerful than any modern dragon died out ages ago the parent to all these different diverse types of dragons mm. and it's asking them to to bring the fossils back to him innocent enough of a request until <laughs> the lich resurrects it makes it more powerful and now the party has to fight it oh my god now not only do you have a resurrected proto dragon you have a what possibly could be like a Draco Lich proto dragon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Overpowering the Lich controller. <laughs> oh man. Very cool. I definitely have it like fused with it as well, Final Fantasy style, and just have like the yeah. torso on top. <laughs> oh, this is it definitely... just takes the Lich is already undead, so he's yeah, he he's turns busy. it into his phylactery. Mm. Oh, damn, mm. that's dope. That's right. Transfers that into it, awesome. and then it just be. First big power. Yeah, like, yeah. okay, oh, yeah, he, like, go ahead, try to destroy my phylactery. It's a true vases, man. Let's just do that already, right? Dragon. You just like put their consciousness into like another body. <laughs> You'd be like, I want to be this dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's right up there with the lich that decided to make the moon his phylactery. Oh, yeah. damn. What? Oh, fuck. <laughs> cool. I was uh, in a previous campaign I ran uh, there. I was using a module for Acquisitions Incorporated and there was a council meeting for a bunch of liches. So I thought it'd be fun to just have like <laughs> liches from all over the world show up there and they'd have like their own little gimmick. One was uh, the big bad lich from uh, one of the modules. Then another was Vecna. Like everyone knows Vecna. Okay, right. And then I th started making up a couple liches, and one of them was just this asshole that's like, Yeah, dude, you, you, who is going to blow up the moon? Certainly not me. <laughs> not you. Oh, what person is going to touch the moon? And it's like, Yeah, yeah, we get it. He, he thinks he's cool because his phylactery is the moon. I mean, what a pompous <laughs> asshole, right? <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, it'd be like you wake up one day and there's another moon. You're like, wait a minute. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, like the concept that this guy went up to the moon and then <laughs> claimed it for himself. And then, okay, <laughs> if you want to stop him, you have to destroy the moon. <laughs> like he was never actually a threat. He was just this dude chilling out doing his thing. But yeah. if he ever now became he a threat. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. Especially like if we gave him some power over the moon, he could effectively control to a degree certain lycanthropes. Oh yeah, I actually uh, I don't know if my players will be watching this, but that's that's the whole premise for my uh, my second campaign that I'm going to be running is uh, a group called the um... Gone from my head now. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the big, big group of cults that uh, basically uh, they're, they're called the Red Parade, and they hate like and tropes and all that kind of stuff and they don't mm. think all that stuff is like they're all they're magic and all that nasty so they want to uh take control of the room so that they can get rid of all those kind of people mm. i like it that sounds pretty awesome it'd be hilarious like okay we got to control the moon oh sorry someone else already beat us <laughs> yeah, it's and it... the flag. <laughs> <laughs> property of mr lich yeah there's just a little flag <laughs> don't touch <laughs> this is I licked it. It's mine. I was just gonna say I licked it. <laughs> I licked it. It's mine. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all I have for today. Cool. Just one last thing is uh, <laughs> the proto dragon theory. Also, apparently, had many inconsistencies and didn't cover the origins of. Uh, Chronic species unrelated to the chromatic and metallic dragons. And there were some apologists of the proto dragon theory that even went as far as to speculate that any kind of proof the existence of more species, such as the Eo Draco Orientalis, and it's like I said before, um, in an attempt to explain the existence of the draconic species not covered by the main proto dragon theory. <laughs> They're just like, oh, but there, there's more, guys. What about these ones? <laughs> what about Hydra? Actually, no one's considered that. Uh... <laughs> um, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I've been out here in the back end of nowhere and uh, found all this. Yeah, I was surprised there wasn't, you know, more on these, but like, still pretty interesting. That's fun. I think it's kind of a good thing that there isn't more on it. Because yeah. as a DM, it's like, oh, what, my metagaming players are going to come out and just think they know a, what a proto and stat block should look like? No, <laughs> let me just uh, take uh, your, uh, this dragon stat, this ancient one, and just uh, dial it up a little bit more. And then the thing, the whole idea that, like, they weren't that smart, but mm-hmm. they were, like, big and, yeah. like, just stronger wyverns, like, it's kind of, like, oof. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. yeah. You could tweak that. Okay. We could give them the some like, of, yeah, like I'm thinking like crazy, evolutionarily, like, like maybe they had abilities that were kind of right. bred out, you know? Yeah, like like a, like a gravity breath or like something like I don't yeah, know, like that. Yeah, like it didn't work out. It, it didn't. It didn't take. It'd be cool yeah, if it was like too powerful for this something. like line. Yeah, that would be something. Oh, you know what would make sense because they would they would kind of force them to like distill. You know, I mean, mm-hmm, over mm-hmm. the evolutionary lines and stuff. It's like it's like anything. Like you know, we all the things that survived the ice age were just like tiny little weasels and stuff. So yeah, the, the, the dragons are like babies in compared to like what these things were. Right. Ooh. And to think about like an ancient dragon, like being like, oh, the Eo Draco ancestors were mighty enough to rival like the gods themselves. Like, oh my god. Because you could already do that, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, the gods nerfed them. They're like, oh, these guys are getting a bit out of control now. You can hear, like a lot of the, the, the gods had to release a new patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Patch note. These are this is better. I mean, like the dragons believe, like what they believe their history is. They think they like they're like world conquering. The Eo Dracos came here because they wanted it. Type of deal. Like that's cool. <laughs> Want Tirzu to do something on that? Yeah. <laughs> if Cortez was a dragon, <laughs> I love that. That's great. Oh, no. I I love how like that complains of the whole pride of dragons too. They're like the mm. gods feared us so much they destroyed the world. Like, <laughs> yeah, they turned us into what's basically puppies now. <laughs> yeah, they started to domesticate us. Yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> dude. The concept that, I mean, thousands of years ago, I mean, we had yeah. like big wolves, like actual yeah. threat wolves, and that Fire now, wolves and shit. <laughs> yeah, now everything's just straight nerfed down to Chihuahua and Pug. Like mm-hmm. a Pug has so many health issues, it shouldn't exist. It was bred <laughs> into being what it is. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what, you know, pseudo dragons and like drakes and fairy dragons are. They're like yeah. the puppies of dragons. That would be a cool plot if a dragon realizes like they're actually not all that. Like they are yeah. like puppies to compare to what they used to be and they want to bring back it's dragons the to the original <laughs> form. A dragon with humility and that introspection is. that wants to return to, uh, <laughs> return to nature. Yeah, that'd be cool. Make that'd be wild and, and, and huge again. Yeah, mm-hmm. you see, because usually everyone like... knows that one guy that's all like returned to monkey, but once the dragon gets that mentality, <laughs> yeah, dragons are already like, we got to be as powerful as we can just because. But if they're like, there was a state where we were like at the pinnacle of our power, like, we, then they're going to be like, we got to get back there no matter mm-hmm, what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. For a big what bad, doing, that'd be amazing. A dragon that yeah. wants to bring back the old, and the only way to do that is to do all this convoluted magic shit to bring back the old, breed it with the new, and then, in, in addition to start that... a new line? Oh, start a, Yes, That's yes. Cool. Start, not just start a new line, but they would also have to start exponentially larger conflicts that would destroy everything in the process because mm-hmm. nothing breeds strength like conflicts. This is a conversation. I like I'm it. taking out some. Oh, I've become a Just watch. <laughs> Our channel oh, blows up one day, and it. all the players hate me for making their campaigns too difficult. <laughs> the DMs everywhere taking notes like, fuck you, Orion. Why'd you do this? These dragons are too strong. What have you done? Make dragons great again. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, dragons are weak. I, I know. <laughs> oh, oh my god. god, I gotta make a Trump dragon now. Oh my god. Trump dragon! <laughs> yes! 
Dude, ultimately, like this is why I'm trying to achieve with these statements. You know, bring light to these less talked about. Yeah, Red Dragons, dragon. 2024. <laughs> Everyone loves dragons, but like, who would talk about like the granddaddy of dragons? <laughs> like, yeah, they're old news. They were washed out. <laughs> Fake news. The future is now, news, old man. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, oh. what about the Godfather of dragons? Who the fuck is the Godfather of dragons? You Ooh. know what I mean? Yeah. Dude, because like, now, now I'm thinking about like that explains and where do dragon turtles fall on this line, right? So like. But also, like, Hydras, you don't really hear much about Hydras. And, like, if their only line or only connection to the Eo Dracos is, like, themselves, (laughs) 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 they're, like, the purest of all, right? Yeah, but they're bastards. They're, like, uh, it's, like, with um, Tiamat, like, they were making up dragons, and that was the first prototype, and there were, like, two like them. They're, like, eh, no. (laughs) I mean, that makes sense why Tiamat is the way you know, they are. They're like ah, so you're saying a proto dragon might have more than one head. I mean, they they did find the the multi headed ones, so that I yeah. assume they exist or existed. I guess. <laughs> I think there's too much potential here because holy shit! Yeah, <laughs> Every yeah, time we come up with an idea, just by stuff what you're saying, <laughs> it's escalating and. The audience is going to be scared <laughs> to be in the next campaign. I tell you, you that. Are cook- <laughs> <laughs> Cooking live. <laughs> uh, DMs must best be handing out those anti dragon swords, a plus five or something. <laughs> <laughs> but look, how you get to make, you know, a fucking proto dragon blade. Like, <laughs> yeah, make your players as powerful as you can, then you can do whatever, you can do all this cool stuff. Ooh, proto dragon fossils carved out to be like a dr- anti dragon war hammer. You have to oh, defeat cool. them yeah. with their own power. Go full monster hunter. Nice. So I love the idea of like finding like fossils, like we said earlier, like more commonly. She's been like, you find like undescriptive bones, you know what I mean? Like, you're not yeah, really sure yeah. what it could be. <laughs> or like these, these bones are radiating an odd source of magic. Yeah. Seen before. Like, I bet you could do that with other things too, like say yeah. an abolith. Oh yeah. god. What if you consumed an abolith fossil? <laughs> become aberration. <laughs> yeah, start growing yeah. extra limbs, tentacles, and all <laughs> Yeah, that. you're just like <laughs> wait, Grim Hollow has rules for that actually. Basically, yeah. You can uh become an aberration, yeah. Nice. That's dope. Grim Hollow that, awesome. that is. And normally, right. I would say yes. go for the IRL fight score, but this is just a nope. Yeah, this is this is less of like creature specific and more like you know. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll always kind of do it like this for our dragon episodes. There's no fight in them. It's a, it's a dragon. That's what we do the like the proto dragon episode or not pro right the, the pseudo dragon episode, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you you, you heard, about, heard a pseudo dragon. Talk about that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'll, I'll that's the equivalent take of trying drink. to strangle a cat. You know, like who strangles a cat other than that psychopath down the trailer park? Like, ain't, Drakes ain't are basically dragon wolves. That. So, like, <laughs> yeah. I love Drakes. Dire dragon. <laughs> we yeah, haven't done cool. I, I like the concept of a dire dragon. Like, holy shit. <laughs> Bones coming out of all, well, like all over. <laughs> oh, oh, like that, no like metal. the elements that they control are also unstable. So, like, there's like bits of jets of fire shooting out of them as well. God, now I'm just thinking of like. See, this is, is this goes back to what I was saying before the show. He's over in Finland, and like they got more metal bands than a- any other countries in the world. Like all those oh uh, Norwegian God. countries. So it's like he's just got. <laughs> It's being infused into his imagination here. <laughs> Most metal <laughs> fucking <laughs> dragon. <laughs> have you have you guys heard about the? I think we, I might have mentioned it a little bit before, but like, have you guys heard about the stuff that's like they're finding in the melted ices of like Antarctica and stuff? Uh, stuff Dude, I am out. hyped for whatever they find because while everyone else is like, "Oh no, global warming," I'm me. I'm just like Antarctica needs to melt. I have to know. I mean, they're already finding, like, you know, old viruses and fossils and shit. Uh, they start finding, like, dragons. 
fossils. Yeah, that's what they yes. all are. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they all went to Antarctica for some reason. <laughs> like, I mean, look, a lot of people believe, like, I like conspiracies and everything, and I think they're fun to talk about, but, like, a lot of people truly believe that the entrance to Hollow Earth is in Antarctica, and that's why they don't let people go there. There's some kind of weird for. gravity anomaly in some hole under the ice. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that's it. I, I, I want to believe, man. Because shit, like all the permafrost is melting, all like the, you know, all the ice that was never really meant to melt. That whole continent is about to like awaken to the world again. Like, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Like, there could be literally anything on there. <laughs> like, what, if they, what if the fucking giant glacier breaks and they're just an egg? <laughs> just, just it's, a it's an egg. I think you like Finnish um, mythology. Goddamn! The world was birthed when this god came out of an egg. Like this giant bird came out of an egg, mm-hmm. and like the shell became one thing, and then the bird became another. Thing. It's like it's cool. I Dude, love that. <laughs> I don't know if you're like a fan of Digimon, but like my brain immediately okay. goes to like the Digimon movie, where, like the giant egg comes out of the sky mm-hmm. and the. Open. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's such a good movie. Like the soundtrack in that movie. Is dope. It was oh, like it, it was busting out uh, that song from Smash Mouth that everyone identifies it as like the Shrek song. But <laughs> then you got that guy Dude, that's that's what I'm kind of waving his arms, just dancing along to it. He's like, "Hey." hey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love this most of it. And that's how I knew it before Shrek came out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. You're not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's in my playlist. I'll sing it with the kids, you know? Oh, yeah. I feel like it. now would be a good minute to take a quick break and go get our drinks, a bathroom break before we get into our news and stuff. Well, I can just dive right in the news. You can go take a piss. <laughs> I would love to take a bathroom break. <laughs> I've been yeah. <laughs> go, right, <laughs> go, go right ahead, you two. T- take a brief uh, interview. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Mm. Brief intermission. All right, just waiting for Sam and Goblin, and we'll be good to go. That's you. Ah, thank you. It's too tight. Oh. It has been a day for me. Oh. Hank. I was uh, walking through the snow today. Like, like getting food here sometimes is like it's like going out into the wild and then going hunting or something. Yeah, you get a trek through snow to get to the shop at the moment. And, uh... Uh, I feel that. Like, uh, I live in uh, Maine, which is one of the more northern states in America. And it's just like, 
We've already had snow. Uh, like we still got some snow on the ground right now, actually. Gross. <laughs> I will not be a snow apologist. We have a couple <laughs> of feet of snow at the moment. Uh, it's just wild. And, oh, that uh, that is like yeah. we don't even like we got some scattered around, but it's not that much. Yeah, it, it's come very early here. Uh, it's just white everywhere. It's crazy. Um, Damn. But uh, you know, when we went off, there's like a bunch of things on sale. Like there's like a big five kg bag of potatoes for like two euros. I was like, well, I gotta get that. And, then That's actually like, a these... really good deal. Like, crazy. I'm like, well, I gotta get that. But in the, I had like like twenty <laughs> kg, thirty, forty kg of stuff dragging back with me. Like, the biggest <laughs> workout I've had in a while. Uh, I, I about imagine Only one like, trip. I hope. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'd be a shot to your pride if you did it in multiple trips. I'll say that. God, yeah, that'd be rough. Nobody on our show is taking multiple trips when they're shopping. <laughs> I'd be kicked off immediately. <laughs> God damn it, Fen, scrap the episode. <laughs> yeah. now, that's about as close to a rite of passage as modern men have. When you're a teenager, at some point you, you're helping out or taking care of groceries, bringing them into the house, and you realize it's all the groceries or nothing. <laughs> and in that Something moment, in your brain you are, you are a man. <laughs> my fingers with the like, you know, the, with the plastic of the bags yeah. are like getting thin and like they're just guillotine them. <laughs> yeah, must well, endure. <laughs> there, there's not much left for a rite of passage for modern men. Like women, mm-hmm. they got rite of passages all day: uh, quinceañeras, sweet sixteen, <laughs> bat mitzvah. Uh, I mean, sure, uh, Jewish boys get their bar mitzvah. Sure, sure. But what what do the rest of us get? We we get, you know, carrying groceries into the house. Shave your beard. <laughs> <laughs> I shave. That's about it. That's where it starts. Uh, I'm clearly a man who shaves. <laughs> I, I mow my beard like a lawn. You do got a nice goatee going. Yeah, it's nice shit. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, you fit uh, right here in Finland. It's like that's the classic uh, uh, yeah. beard here in Finland. Very long. I just don't look right without it, you know. It's just that's true. I, my daughter says I'm ugly if I don't have uh, facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> just <Damn>. outright. <laughs> Kids are gold. They, they are. <laughs> My brother uh, was the worst for when he was a kid. You know, he'd pass by somebody, he'd be out shopping, and he'd be like, why is she wearing such a stupid hat? And it's like, well, yeah, okay. I mean, I can't argue with you. <laughs> like, the hat is a bit funny, but, like, just don't say it like that, I guess. <laughs> my kids are cold. Uh, yeah. uh, absolutely. <laughs> but my kid's going to be cold and dangerous because, like, I set up a bunch of targets right next to the house, and I bought a slingshot the other day. They they actually had to card me for the ammo for it because, like, a, <laughs> yeah, I, I had to get carded for a thing of marbles. Yeah, they're deadly. They're <laughs> it's like if, if I had gone into the toy section and just bought a bag of marbles, I don't think I would have been know. carded. Go to your local park and pick up a handful of rocks. <laughs> like... Well, I got pl- plenty of pebbles <laughs> on the side of the house. I just wanted like some consistent ammo because, like, if you're going to use a slingshot or a sling, having regular Pe- consistent That's ammo fine. to practice your shots with is good. But also, clearly, you should have gone like, to Home Depot and bought a bag of two thousand ball bearings. <laughs> you know, that's pretty solid. I've heard of people with a sling using lead shot. Where it's just like, okay, you got like a, a... oh my god, <laughs> yeah. like dude, I I've been researching slings and like there's this guy on YouTube, absolutely ripped, jacked guy. Like he does all of his videos shirtless, and it's just like, course, okay, uh, what? what? Like you telling me that if I whip out a war bow and a sling and just start hacking away at armor, I can be as jacked as this guy? Because like, dude is chiseled. <laughs> <You> mean. <laughs> But uh, from the research I've done, slings are just as deadly and can get a further range than a bow, which is mind boggling. There's actually a type of sling where it's just like a staff with a with your little rope sling on the end and you just like, bam, 
Like you so get all that leverage. The, the dog bowl. Not the ones where like you essentially have like a sling, but it fires like a bolt instead. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, that okay. that's a thing too. Uh, it, there's also those javelins where they have a rope, right? And it's basically a sling a javelin. You don't see enough uh, of these things in D and D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you, you use them to put spin on the javelin. Cool. What the fuck? Hey, yo. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like in the NFL where people take a football and like you get a perfect spiral and it just it goes better. You know, you got like Gurren Logan piercing shot. <laughs> yes, Gurren like Lagen. it oh gives you God. more penetrating power. Throw to pierce the heavens, man. <laughs> I think that in regular D and D, people need to put more respect on the sling. First off, a D four damage, yeah, sure, but like, do that for a light sling, a heavy sling. Like, dude, you're whipping around some heavy ammo that can just cave a man's skull in with a single shot, even if they're wearing a, a uh, iron we, helmet or whatever. I'm sure we've we've all seen Deadly as Warrior though, but like, we we know what like a like a rock will do to some decent armor. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's wild, dude. Put some awesome. respect on slings. Yeah, I like I like the idea of the D four being like the base damage, and then whatever ammunition you start using that adds other dice. Ooh, I like that. I mean, in the one piece campaign. Like, oh. well, I was thinking of uh, if you use things like say you put a bunch of ball bearings in like a little sack, and then you sling that, and boom, they spread yeah. everywhere. So you alchemist gun, fire but... in like a tiny bottle, boom! Yeah, yeah. You get the impact plus you alchemist fire. There you go. Yeah. You got to mention like Usopp or something with uh, his like exploding, <laughs> exploding ammo and all that. Well, that's the fun thing. One of our uh, party members for the upcoming campaign, uh, Mika, yes. she's going to be playing the captain, and she's going full Usopp sling build, and nice. I love it. Okay. Especially when she's going to be half time. giant, so she's going to be a big ass fucking woman with a oh, big damn. ass fucking sling. Like damn. she'll probably just slap in a cannonball, and be like, "Fuck are you!" <laughs> if you give if you give Goliath the the sling instead of David, that is <laughs> that is enough to sink a ship. I would say, like if yeah, like, cool. if David could take down Goliath. With a D4 sling, imagine what Goliath could do with a D10 sling. From <laughs> yeah. just like all these boulders, like. <laughs> dude, <laughs> that that'd be wild. Because slings, like they they add more power to the strength that you're putting into them. Yeah. So you get a a straight Goliath, just bam. That is lethal. That is dangerous. It's what I always think like like warm malls, not warm malls. Uh, the the flails are cool. Like yeah, know, yeah, because you're getting that centripetal force. Yeah, yeah. one of my friends is uh, going specializing in like a, 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 a rope dart. Is it? I think they're rope darts. They yeah, have, like, the rope darts at the are end crazy. Of the string. Yeah, yeah, they're super cool. It's gonna make a monk built with rope darts and have to make some Ooh. custom weapon for it. But I love but, rope darts. They're, they're awesome difficult to use but damn if they don't look cool yeah and not to mention you get like a little taste of that indiana jones uh vibe you know oh yeah for sure so cool all right don't you uh go ahead and hit the news ah the news huh this week in nerdy news <laughs> 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 uh, uh, it gets me every time <laughs> but so far we do have some interesting things from dice breaker this week now starting off we got Baldur's gate and knights of the old republic lead developer releases a hellish D, D adventure for charity so this happened <laughs> earlier this week yeah all proceeds of uh james olin and adrian uh I'm going to butcher this because I don't know Russian. Uh, Tchaikovsky? Yeah, Tchaikovsky's. Tchaikovsky's. A chain of As Asmodeus. Yeah, I can say Asmodeus. Uh, huh. Will support extra life. Extra life. Is, is that like a nerdy... Uh, That's the, uh, charity, is it? 
Yeah, yeah that's a charity. Isn't it? Oh, it's a Children's Miracle Network uh, thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. I, I like when people use their hobby to support children. I, I As a parent, I... Well, actually, just as a fucking person, I like when kids <laughs> don't die. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Good on you guys. I, I love that. Yeah, man. That's awesome. So they, they put a book together and co-authored it set in the nine hells and all proceeds are being donated to the children's miracle network hospital via the extra life charity. Okay. So extra life is just like a, a nerdy, uh, intermediary. Okay. That's cool. Cool. And both of those games, Baldur's gate and Knights of the old Republic are fantastic. Like my dad is big into Knights of the old Republic. Let's see, Sk skimming, 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 but yeah, uh, that's awesome, and it's selling for four thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, so it's available on Dungeon Masters Guild for about twenty nine ninety nine US dollars. One and sold. Is a, and it's a print on demand thing. So if anyone's interested in supporting children not dying. <laughs> Please <laughs> donate. <laughs> what kind of person are you, huh? <laughs> Would you I buy a know. book for <laughs> and add it book. to your D and D <laughs> collection if it meant a kid could learn to play D and D one day by living well, they, long enough to roll dice? Well, I don't well. think advertise like Sarah McLaughlin anymore, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Okay, I, I think I'd be more on board if these children learn to suffer from... We, we swap their uh, illness what? for crippling dice addiction. They will hey, suffer yo? from oh, dice... Yeah, yeah, I was like, where's this going? This is getting... This is getting... <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 that's safe, that's safe. <laughs> yeah, it's going there for <laughs> Yeah, got the redirect! <laughs> I think they should suffer more, and... <laughs> you know what? No, nah, actually, <laughs> they should have worse. <laughs> you know what? Fuck these kids. <laughs> Lifelong addiction to dice. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, we got Dungeons and Dragons wants uh, its 24, uh, 2024 rule books to stay relevant and compatible for another decade. Good fucking luck, Wizards of the Coast. Like, holy shit. Y'all have been screwing the pooch this year. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with that. Like, do, I mean, where try. do you start with that? They want their stuff to stay relevant and compatible. Cool. Great business model. How about yeah. you just uh, not fuck up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to I your mean, marketing team. Fire will. all of them. <laughs> Like, I mean, it's essentially like it's the players, right? And the DMs that are like keeping them relevant. It's like they don't really have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And the fifth, fifth edition is great for that specifically. It's so simple yeah. that you can mod it so easily. Yeah. So, I mean, like to them, this is very possible. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I think the best bet would be to, instead of letting all these things get straight crowdfunded, no, yeah. I love crowdfunding. But if they got on the ground and made offers to these Kickstarter people yes. and try to pay them out better than their projected stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. That would like be the backing, smart play. Like, you know, like homebrew creators or something? Like... You know, what, what they need to do is start, like you said, start backing the small-time creators because these are the people making for your hobby. If you want to make money as a company, you got to put the money where it should be going, and that's to the people that are doing the real work. Like not to say you know they probably aren't doing you know work in those but offices. They but probably like, are, but let's just yeah. face it: the passion not of out someone... a homebrew every day. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, like Amethyst Dragon had him on the show a, a couple times. Man of over 1,500 homebrews. That's a lot of homebrew. Damn, that is a lot. <laughs> Holy crap. Man, that's insane. And, it's uh, he's sad, a like, father, too. You know, so it's like... With such dedication to this hobby and this, you know, community. And they're like... Wizards of the Coast is like... Good luck, guys. Keep it up for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, 
they'll be lucky if they can stay relevant. I, I personally think that they can do it, but they need to get Hasbro off their back. Like Hasbro has been suffering a lot. Like even Bank of America has changed their stance on them. They're like, hey, we were like saying that people should invest, but now we're just kind of like back to neutral. Like y'all are like dropping our expectations. It's a shame. And I think that there's, they could salvage all of this, but it's going to take a lot of community building to rebuild the goodwill that was burned. They might even have to martyr somebody to do it. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Maybe make but, up an entire a team of people. Be like, yeah, we fired those guys. They, they were ruining everything. I mean, yeah, the, the problem is, it's like the person you need to fire is the person who's above everything. <laughs> <laughs> they're above consequences. Don't worry well, about as it. In, yeah, they're like just so high up. The show. Like that's where most of the problems. Are. I don't think the problems are really coming from the actual office that make the actual creative content. It's like it's I just, would a hundred percent agree because it's cool. always the people up top. Yeah, yeah. and. The, the people like the people that are doing good for the community are down here on ground level with us. We're all just content creators making fun stuff. Look, I'm not like a stock guy, you know, I don't really know finances and stuff, but I'm looking at like the Hasbro stock for this past like week. And <laughs> did it drop again? <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Where is it? Where That's is it, Sam? So, okay. So, I think probably the last time we talked about it was probably last month, right? We said it was around like 40, something like that. Since... Breaking news. <laughs> Stock <Yeah>. prices. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it looks like they're down, what, 7% this week? I think they're that's less... big. That sounds big. That sounds like that, sounds that, that is big, right? <laughs> that, that, that is big. So, okay, well, so, it's, it's, so November 6th, November, they went from 4652 Oh, it's holy man. shit, dude. When we last checked, it was in the 50s, like 56. Yeah, yeah now they're at 4311. <laughs> dude, dude they're, the possibility they're of us dude. buying Hasbro out as a community, if everyone <laughs> comes together, it's getting closer. If oh, everyone yeah, in the right. audience has $40. Yeah, looking at the month here. So last month, to say Wednesday, October 11th, was 5877. They've dropped almost $15, right? <laughs> wait sam is it a criminal act if i tell everybody in our our audience and the twitters to just boycott wizards and hasbro so that we can buy them out is is that criminal <laughs> I, I, am i liable if that happens <laughs> oh, i was looking up <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not a i'm not a legalese i'm not a lawyer so someone uh, let me know but in the meantime we do have one last <laughs> bit of news uh, from Dicebreaker, a chat GPT yeah. will soon let an AI teach you board game rules. Now, dude, chat GPT is going to teach me how to D&D. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at the <laughs> <looking at that. laughs> <laughs> uh, one, one last thing, just to like really give you an idea of like how bad they're fucking up. Okay, one, okay. one last tip is I click off. I this. love <laughs> stats. Give me a stat, Sam. So the high for them this year was in September. At it, it looks it like, maybe like 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 a, like a seventy two, you know, ninety something. <laughs> oh, like the highest. <laughs> They've almost yeah. dropped by half. Yeah, minus thirty two point one percent from last year. Duh. Uh, they'll maybe... probably jump up a little bit because December is coming up and like that's gift giving season. So that's yeah. going to be right now is supposed to be about their best time of year for the next six weeks. I know that. <laughs> I know their like big Christmas thing that they seem to have released, which is the uh, deck of many things. Like it's not getting good reception, which is unfortunate yeah. as well. Cause it's just so much. Yeah. Cost so like, much as well. Not to mention like so many people have like, covered that as third-party content creators months <laughs> in advance and have done better so yeah. yeah. kind of late to the show wizards like you might have been working on this in the background for a couple years but <sighs> that ain't it <laughs> I, I, I go ahead and finish I <laughs> well numbers i mean there, there's a whole article talking about it but really the title tells you everything right there 
like you and I have worked with chat GPT in our server because uh, in our discord server, we have nerd bot, uh, Boris actually added a, another one recently. And then we got Paka and these AIs know a lot about D and D because D and D is a very structured thing, very well documented across the internet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I ask for D and D rulings or stuff like the concept that chat GPT could be a DMS, uh, you know, kind of backup side DM. Like sometimes as a new DM, you need to have somebody that can help you with rules and stuff on the fly when you're in a game. And what do you do if everybody else in your party is also new? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, chat GPT. Like what, what is X, Y, Z? Just type it in real quick. Like, uh, Sam, how much should a iron sword be? Uh, I, I wouldn't know, you know? Probably like 10 silver. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Less than a gold, more than a few silver. Yeah, well, what's the damage on a warmall? Like, some people are a little bit more technical and not so laissez-faire about their rulings, which yeah. I'm more of a, I'll make shit up. Like, I might also, not have the answer, but the I will make money. an answer, you know? <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, it definitely can depend on, like, you know, what town you're in, you know, what kind of economy your world is rocking. Yeah, but the thing is, or if you're looking like for a rule, rather than just simply, oh, hey, what's this thing? And then maybe you look it up on Google. Google has been indispensable for a lot of DMs over the years. <laughs> Some would say, like, okay, uh, downright useful. <laughs> <laughs> exactly well this takes that to its next logical conclusion because an ai is going to be helping you kind of parse through that information way faster so rather mm -hmm. than hold up your campaign for like a minute while you go through uh, like a, an entire reddit post like does this work this way you can just be like right. hey chat gpt did, 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 did. oh cool and then it that. just generates a, a response you, you just give it a quick glimpse Okay, cool, cool. The game continues a little bit smoother. We could increase efficiency by twenty percent because I <laughs> because I said twenty percent. Yeah, it sounds sounds good to me. It sounds solid. Yeah. I think it's most thing to right. That's 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 the number you use typically for this kind of stuff. Those yeah, are yeah. Numbers. You should look it up with Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold me to it, but that's a stat. <laughs> it is a stat. <laughs> But yeah, that covers our a. Uh, I was gonna say that covers our AI, but no, that that's the news for the week, Sam. <laughs> nice, nice. Some fun bits, good little things to look forward to. Some, uh, that, from, if we have uh, any people who are into financials, maybe they you know got a little bit from our stock conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we're educated in. <laughs> and... <laughs> I get all my stock advice from GPT. But, you, yeah. you know, that's okay because I don't have money to invest in the first place. You know just as much as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> now, that sounds about right. A except oh. I do know that Wizards is falling apart because Hasbro's falling yeah. apart. So, Speaking of knowing things, you also know a word that I didn't this week. So why don't you tell us what the rest of it is? Ah, yes. For this week's Tell all the rest of us. So. <laughs> That's my eye. I really like up my words for a second. <laughs> well, this is a, a, a bit more of a term yeah. than, than, a, than just a word, but it's the Pygmalion effect, also known as the Rosenthal effect. R Rosenthal effect, not Rosenthal. Oh, okay. Rosenthal. <laughs> Sounds like a like a vitamin. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, if a psycholog if a psychology was a vitamin, then yes. So this is a phenomenon in which high expectations lead to improved performance in an area where low expectations lead to worse. Okay. Now, this could be something that maybe a more intelligent NPC might bring up. Like, oh, yes, uh, I'm going... Th th he's a very Pygmalion type. If you tell this man uh, what the expectations are, then that sets the expectations and it actually goes a step further. You could, in, you could really describe Kuatoa in this way because <laughs> they effectively f function that way and affect reality, creating gods out of nothing through the Pygmalion mm -hmm. effect. That's so cool. I love That's it. That's true. Yeah, okay. So you're cooking, you're cooking. 
Yeah, and it has its roots in some Greek myths about a some sculptor that fell in love with his uh, art or whatever. But hey. the the main thing is like if you expect that you're going to do real well in something, then sometimes that expectation will improve your performance the same as doing worse. Now, a lot of new DMs struggle with this kind of thing because they have low expectations on themselves. Inversely, mm. some people uh, end up be ending up on r slash uh, uh, RPG horror stories because they have too high of an expectation. Okay, okay. I see. I'm looking at some of these like um, these charts that kind of describe it, and so I'm oh, looking yeah? at this. And yeah, yeah, I can go ahead and see the chat. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, oh. So, yeah, here's, here's probably a good example. We'll, see here. well, you're always on top of those things. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to keep myself busy while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> I, I can engage with you. <laughs> not An just agent of chaos? <laughs> so I'm not just sitting here fiddling my thumbs, you know? <laughs> oh, I gotta fiddle that beard. <laughs> I get distracted. <laughs> You're like, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You got like a little graphic here. People's yeah, impression yeah. about you improves your image, impacts people's perception about you, which influences self improvement and changes mm. people's impression about you. Okay. So it's a positive or negative feedback loop of making mm -hmm. someone become better. And yeah. that goes hand in hand oh, with what makes a good D&D campaign. You see, if you let your DM know what they're doing well and what you liked and encourage other members of the party to express their sentiments, mm -hmm. that creates a positive feedback loop. Essentially, you know, creating a character is you creating an image, right? And what do you want your impact to be on the people around you? You already have the idea of like how you want to be perceived. Like, yeah. You don't really get to choose how they perceive, you know what I mean? And then, like, you know, that can influence how your character or how you change as a person, you know, which therefore influences their impressions. You know, yeah, I, I feel it. Yeah, I, it definitely goes both ways. It's like, a cycle of character growth and development. Yeah, and this is a cycle of growth and development that can be applied to both the player and the DM. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good, good in choice. short, talk to your players after a game. Like, a lot of people, if you ask them, hey, how was the game? They're like, yeah, it was good. They're good. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes if you just give a little bit of honest feedback to your DM, like, hey, I liked this thing that you did. That made me feel real good about the campaign. I do mm -hmm. think that you could improve uh, by doing less of other thing. Right. Or ask your players, you know, what was your favorite moment from the campaign? You know, did they have a moment where, like, maybe things could have been better? Yeah. What do you what want to see more of? of? Yeah, what do you want to see yeah. more of? Yeah. And sometimes, like, as a DM, letting your players know, hey, that thing you did, I want to see more of that. Yeah. And that's actually a mechanic built into 5th edition D&D &D through the points of inspiration. Mm-hmm. If you that. award those every time that you, someone does something RP wise that fits, it works, it's good. You can do more with the point of inspiration or do something else with them. I yeah, know. I mean, like, if someone's going to do something cool, I'm going to try to make it happen as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and also, you know, give them mechanical benefits. Like, yeah, like I have this really lovely rule if you both roll the same number on initiative, you get to combo your moves. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's something I do. I yes, love it's, it. It's so much fun. And like, there was these two people. One had the ability to kind of like freeze things. They had like a patron who was like all around ice. And the other one was all about uh, water. And uh, so they had a bunch mm. of holy water and stuff. And they could manipulate water. And they're fighting a bunch of vampires. And mm. so they wanted to combo their moves. So one of them shaped the water into like spikes. The other one froze them. And they made these holy oh. water stakes that they pierced nice. the vampires with. And I was like, I want to see more of that. That's dope. So I just had to like do times four damage with this spell that they. I, I love that, and it's really cool because like when I do that in my campaigns, I want team moves to happen because yeah. cool. team moves are awesome. I even worked on some rules for that a while back. I'll probably have to release a PDF or something so that people can try that out. But the the main idea for this is just like 
you said when people roll the same number instead of oh hey you go separately no nope. you rolled the same you two are going at the same time now i won't do it the same with enemies because that gets convoluted and weird but <laughs> now that you're both going at the same time there's no time delay in you taking your actions so yeah. everything that you're doing you're doing together yeah. i love the idea of like you look over just give like that nod and yeah. just, Oh, <laughs> they don't even say anything. And like, I, I know that a couple of my players who are really into the game, there's, there's a few different ways it can go. Like, some like don't think you should be able, you should be able to pair up and, and do these couple mm -hmm. moves because you should be able to talk to it. But like, when you're in those moments, it happens all the time in, in, in real life as well. You just get into this zone where you just know what the other person's do, mm -hmm. thinking. Like, in yeah, sports, especially for like sports teams, like that's like a massive thing. You just know what they're thinking. You're all just yeah, that's you true like teamwork. You know, take into account of like you know you you fight life or death with these people you know their abilities yeah. you know like what they're capable of like mm -hmm. like you you hope that they you know expect the same from you and you're like maybe you have a like a split second they'd be like hey here's an idea mm -hmm. like, you know, hey why don't you do this real quick Boom. And yeah, like, yeah exactly like, yeah. And you're also playing the heroic fantasy where you yeah. are just these like super cool uh magic powered superhero you know, kind of types. They get kind of like weird about talking during combat. You like, know, we only have six seconds. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh well, you know, like you guys live together essentially. Like yeah. these could be you know, like prior conversations ideas. You know? Absolutely. Like, yeah, I assume you've talked about battle tactics like at least once. Like, I, I love battle tactics, and it's one of the reasons that I encourage my players generally to come up with plays, you know, uh, much like yeah. a sports team, like you have a playbook. So if you have plays, okay, signature moves. <laughs> maybe these signature moves, these plays can be roles uh, like you make as a group, you know? Yeah. So like, but like, hey, DM, we want to do like, <laughs> want to do the Voltron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, a absolutely. And that's where the homebrew system I was talking about before comes in. Where, yeah. in addition to the inspiration dice, which you can spend on these moves, you also get you can stack up anytime that you would get inspiration normally. That's going to build you up a pool of synchron uh, sync dice. You know, synchron cool. uh, synchronize and whatnot. And when you you roll, per, each player will roll a percentile. And the closer you get to having the same exact number, the the better the outcome is going to be. So cool. if you take the inspiration or the sync dice, you roll those, and that will subtract away from the difference in the two numbers rolled. Mm -hmm. So you, you dial it in closer. So you have a pool of dice that you can use to spend on your special moves. This is dope. That's great. Not to mention, like, I, I always believe in adding bonuses. Like, okay, this does that much damage. This does that much damage. Okay, cool. You, you add that together. And if you get within a certain number range, that's a bonus. And if you get it dead on, crit. Big crit. That's cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I love that shit because it as easy as it is it's also quite a rigid system like 4e is where i came from and you, know, you get all these bonuses, and it is it's hard to like keep track of them for newer players but in the end it's just like there's nothing to just say well you can add plus two to that and then take yeah. maybe minus two to damage or say that a lot of the time people want to jump off stuff and hit things but you could do that but you have maybe minus two to the attack but you get plus two to the damage something something like that yeah like Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why people love a crunchy system like three five, you know? Because mm -hmm. it's not just advantage. Okay, that's a plus one. That's a plus two. That's a plus three, my friend. Yeah. It adds up, you know. People love that oh, it's all coming together. Yeah, you like I think that advantage like actually has like a tangible like idea. Yeah. Like, oh, this is advantageous or like this is a critical hit because 
of these other factors. Yeah, yeah. Or like you're you're one off the dice roll, and then someone's like, "Well, what if I do this?" But they already have advantage, so you can't give them another advantage. But it's like, well, yeah, doing that will definitely bump that up. Like, yeah. yeah. I love when people get like as conscripted as they can with their like spells and their abilities and stuff. I love it. Like the more you detail it out to me, the bigger picture that I can get mm. and figure out. Yeah, like, yeah, like, just because you <laughs> failed doesn't mean that it's a bad roll. Like, if you're missing it by just one or two, mm-hmm. okay, that that's unfortunate, but you got something out of it. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, maybe the barbarian is hitting this uh, guy with everything he's got with that big old war hammer, and... It's blocked just in time. Barely misses the AC by one. So they bring up their shield, block it, and they, they're sent sliding back like maybe five feet. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. They like can't shield for like you know the next round or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love extra effects for weapons, and I was using those kind of rules in the previous campaign, and I love it. Yeah, me too, me too. Right. It's making great time, great conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. You you ready for some homebrew, Sam? Because I think uh, this conversation's leading that way. I'm always ready for some homebrew. Take us Fuck to yeah. the generic realm. To the generic realm. Wrong one. <laughs> realm. Generic realm. Lots of fun. Excellent. <laughs> It's always fun in the generic realm. <laughs> All right. So this week, uh, do you want to start this one off or should I, Sam? Sure, I'll start it up. Cool, cool. This one's a pretty cool one. Um, so normally I bring in like a weapon or something. That's kind of like my forte. But today I was like, let's change it up. Let's bring in like a cool, just a cool item. It kind of reminds me of like, like the mother box from like, DC, you know, if you if you've ever seen like the side. Yes, I, I am very familiar with the mother box. Yeah, so like I saw this and I was like immediately like, oh okay, these are cool. Like <laughs> so these are essentially, you know, four inch wide puzzle boxes um of arcane, you know, creation. They're covered in runes and ah, it's design. A basically, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the rarity can vary between, you know, the difficulty of the boxes or the maker or whatever like that. So the four inch wide puzzle box display complex runes which change each dawn. The box cannot be destroyed except from a disintegrate or wish spell. After three hours oh, of shit. uninterrupted concentration, roll three consecutive intelligence checks, the DC of which depends on the rarity of the puzzle box. So uncommon is a DC 12, rare is a DC 14, 16 for very rare and 18 for legendary. If one of the three checks fail, the box locks, and the puzzle cannot be attempted until it resets at the next dawn. A knock spell can can reduce the number of checks required to two, but no less than two. Okay, I see. Because didn't lock supposed to like unlock, uh, or something like that with like locks or something? I don't know. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I literally I have his. his yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this was uh, number 70, the Arcane Puzzle Box. Yeah, I, I've used these, actually. They're great. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's really cool. We, we have a, a user story here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Got one last sentence here. You can tell me about them. Uh, so you can reduce the number of checks required to two by using the Knock spell. Uh, the last people to successfully open a puzzle box can gain access to it with the touch of their hand. Uh, they also receive a mental alarm whenever a puzzle attempted fails, provided they are on the same plane of existence. Each box contains only one item, no bigger than five cubic feet, which appears once the box collapses open. Okay, cool. Collapses open. That's interesting. Yeah, so I imagine it's kind of like, <laughs> like, yeah, and like maybe it becomes like a small like disc or something. I don't know. <laughs> I personally, if I was oh, to run these, I would raise the DC by two for each tier because i yeah. feel like that's a tad low but yeah three three consecutive intelligence oh yeah checks. you know what yeah you're, you're right you're right but 
for oh, a yeah. legendary though i feel yeah, by yeah. the time that you're attempting something like that you already have stupidly high stats where you're not rowing uh, rolling low with something like that i would add like extra conditions to the locks like maybe like an maybe extra maybe check like or something a, i don't know yeah maybe there's like an elemental attunement required like you know you gotta give it like a certain spell or something like yes yeah, so a little bit more variety because i feel like these have tons of potential right there i mean yeah this is essentially like you got a box it's difficult to open magically Fuck it. <laughs> you can make it you could trap it up like <laughs> Maybe on the second fail, it like shocks you or something. Like, that's crazy. Yes. Every like the second fail, like you triggered the alarm. Maybe you made it past. Like, Fireball. Second fail. Yeah. Fucking detonates. Yeah. <laughs> Third fail, the owner of the box teleports to you. Like, yeah. Yeah. Or like maybe uh, on a failed check, you take a tiny bit of psychic damage. Then the players yeah. are like, holy shit. Uh, that hurt. Oh, and then it speaks in your mind when, like, the final. Oh, It'd be fun though if it's like if it thinks like that when your like intelligence goes down, the harder to Ooh, like keep yeah. opening it. The more like, you try it, the dumber you get. Like, the oh, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. a temporary true. debuff. I, I you don't see enough intelligence debuffs in yeah. fifth edition. Like you'd see that stuff all the time in three five. That makes so you know, that'd because, be fun. Yeah, because they're supposed to be so difficult and like. You're like taking all your concentration to do this. It would make sense to have some mental exhaustion. So I mean, shit. Yeah, I like that. Or like a mana exhaustion, even. Oh yeah, I like that too. Oh yeah, you have to feed it spell slots. That's cool. I like it. Maybe shout out to James Gifford. Ooh. Oh, yeah. I like the sound of that. I'm definitely going to have to add some of that stuff to the upcoming campaign because that would fit very well in a one piece setting. Mm. For sure. Why am I logged into Orion's Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gabe, do you have a, a homebrew yeah. that you want to show off today? I do uh so this is something i use when i've first started my like seven year long campaign uh, it was like they they play their own characters and then they stuck in the feywild and they went back to their original world but then it was like you know two thousand years in the future Ooh. So in a cyberpunk setting like a real grungy cyberpunk setting i like that and uh there's a really cool um there's a whole conversion of fifth edition into what's called uh, fifth age that's a um, pdf called the fifth age it's got like yeah. races classes it's got expanded skill lists and feats and like really cool like high-tech gadgets and they got like prototype gadgets like that that's oh. the magical items in the world it's it's, it's super cool. oh yeah so you posted this in here yeah i like that i'm looking through some of what you sent me on that hmm. Ooh. More downtime shenanigans, investment in trading, and re retirement rules. You know, they just recently came up with retirement rules in official D and D after like a decade. Yeah, no, it's it's very cool. So, and like, I, I, my favorite part is like the weapons list. Um, and what I ended up doing with the weapons list as well is I then also when they're first buying equipment here, they could only get like really cheap stuff. So I added like the debuffs to the weapons as well like sometimes mm. the guns jab or like uh this one is a minus one or this one's sticky for some reason so it's like yeah thing effects but yeah there's, oh, there's so many cool classes are you here over here is really cool as well i like yeah the artwork's amazing the just the i just love that crunchy cyberpunk kind of world oh yeah for sure i would love to i, I always love like this kind of setting too though i've never gotten to play with anything like it yeah a lot of the uh a lot of the buffs it's like the, a lot of the abilities are pretty strong because you're only meant to go up to like level 10 with this right. i think and it adds like a ni nice grittiness to the whole fish but uh yeah my, my players then went from the cyberpunk world they ended up blowing up this world by accident mm -hmm. and uh 
then went back like to the you did that as species instead of races. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it makes it makes so much sense. And they've got like all these different varieties of like humans. So you've got like tube borg, and then you've got uh, cyborgs and androids. Yeah, and... it kind of one. reminds me of uh, Ultra Modern Fifth Edition. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to check that out. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's like basically things? a post-apocalyptic world that's set like a few hundred years in the future. Mm. So you get some of that modern stuff. Like the, I only played like one session of it, and I made my character like half Asian, half Jew, and then to explain why he knew Hebrew, because like he was a linguist, he knew tons of languages. <laughs> like oh, everyone else, those logos. Sorry. <laughs> <Do> I... <laughs> What? Sam? Look at the, the species and look at the aliens and stuff. Oh, so oh okay, cool. okay. Oh, There's the like slugos. graylings or something. Are they called graylings? Yeah, the sluggos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, the sluggos. But yeah, I, I made this character and it's like, oh, how am I going to explain knowing Hebrew? Because I wanted to add Hebrew because I saw that as one of the language options. I'm like, I guess I'm going to be half Jewish. <laughs> and like the campaign was taking place in like russia china area like uh, i'm Ch a half chinese half jew here here we go i know like 10 languages and everyone else is like no all right dude, don't that's a terrible class playing the face in this uh, world you're good you're going to get killed yes but my class starts me off with a car then we spent like an hour <laughs> everybody arguing over how the the car is going to work and ultimately we settled on something akin to the battle shell from ninja turtles because everyone's like no we, we need this specific thing very battle oriented i'm like dude you have no idea how much a minivan does with those sliding <laughs> doors <laughs> that's fine yeah they uh, i think my players ended up having like a giant or v uh, driving through like the wastelands of this world as well when they're in this setting um, and they have vehicles here as well they have loads of vehicles yeah vehicles are cool. so much fun like there's just not enough of them in most uh, settings and that's one of the reasons that i love settings like uh say the, the one piece one where it's like more boats like you don't get enough boats mm -hmm. or eberron cars are a thing trains are a thing mm -hmm. so that's so true yeah, I felt like uh, awesome. it's really cool. And, uh, it's, it's it's a real juicy thing, and they've yeah. updated it throughout the years. Like when we first started using it, it was pretty bare bones. And... Yeah, I love that open source kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's just so much, and they're always making it better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It hasn't updated in a while. I think it looks pretty solid as it is now. I think. It's, it's, I mean, there's so much there. As you, yeah. yeah, years of play testing that, can't be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I can't get that out of it. That's great. But yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my homebrew. Anyone? Yeah, I'm gonna have to go through some of that because kind of I thing? think a lot of it will work for me. Yeah, it was just in, like what I've scrolled through for those pages. All the alien stuff, and I saw the the custom. Yeah. The you did that. It's a really good idea. I think you having like a certain amount of points that you could allocate. You know, I that's that's always fun too yeah i wanted to try to make like a few kind of core races at some point that have that system we've been making one called the doomborn uh Ooh. who are like just destined to either bring in the end to the world or something else and you're usually made when you have very powerful parents like uh you know mm -hmm. cthulhu and uh, a dragon had a child and that's you and so gotcha. you get all these different like things that you get uh, you, you that's know. really cool <laughs> Damn, i like it that sounds awesome, dude. <laughs> okay, so moving into uh, the homebrew I'm bringing in this week. Uh, I'm just keeping it simple because uh, everyone wanted to bring in a little something. So I'm going with something a classic. If y'all like Adventure Time, then you might appreciate the Blade of Grass. <laughs> I just saw oh, that recently. Oh, That's so oh, good. Oh, I'm adding oh, my oh, game as well. It's so cool. It's so dope. It's, it's done so perfectly. Blade of Grass? Yeah, it, it's pun inspired. It's very earthy. Normally, druids are like, oh, I can't, could possibly touch a sword. They're all made of metal. But yeah. Blade of Grass, it's cool. And if you know Adventure Time, you know that Finn like had like a, this grass blade thing pops right out of his hand. Big old thing. Lots of fun. Now, this is brought to you, everyone through dungeon strugglers i don't think we've had any of their stuff on the show before I don't think so. That'd be something later. 
I've seen some of their content. So I'm just going to read over some of the stuff here. Okay, so the Blade of Grass. It's a counts as a scimitar, but obviously you could like do your own thing. This Legendary like requires a tune. Beautiful. Yeah, the, the artwork is amazing. Razor sharp grassy blade of this sword is able to slash with uncanny precision. You gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with it. When you have advantage on an attack roll and roll to hit with the sword, you can roll one additional d20 and choose which of the three dice to use. Holy shit, that's like elven accuracy for a sword. It's really cool. I think it's a legendary. The sword can wrap itself around your wrist, become a grassy bracelet when you're not wielding it, or return to your hand at will. No action required. Yeah, it's just okay. one of those snap on bracelets. <laughs> ah, yes, I love that part. Sweeping strike. As an action when wielding this sword, you can make a broad slash it to hit multiple targets. Each nice. creature within a 15 foot cone must make a DC 18 deck save. Uh, taking 4d6 slashing damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. Nice. It's I think this is something that all weapons should probably have at this point. Like, wh what do you mean I can't hit multiple people with this long? Yeah, race? I like the, the like, idea it's... of uh, excess damage. Like, yeah. if you deal so much and you kill someone, then the excess damage that's left over could be gone on somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, clearly, this person was very inspired by adventure time because moving into the next part <laughs> grass arm as a bonus action while the sword is being worn as a bracelet you can use you can cause it to grow and wreath your entire arm in a grassy mass up to your shoulder the grass takes the shape of a brawny arm <laughs> rippling with uh, vegetal vigor and thistly thorns the grass arm grants you the following benefits you gain a plus 10 bonus to strength checks that involve the grass arm. Unarmed strikes have a plus 3 bonus to attack roll and damage rolls, and deal an extra 3d4 piercing damage to targets uh, you hit with it. That's kind of awesome, actually. Yeah, uh, the hand of this arm can transform into a blade or back into the hand at will, no action required. This mm. jagged blade uh, functions as a grip blade of grass however the sword's reach is increased by five feet it deals an extra 3d4 piercing damage to targets hit by it you gain 10 temporary hit points at the start of each of your turns if you take fire damage this property doesn't function at the start of your next turn the grass arm lasts until you complete a short or long rest or until you dismiss it as a bonus action once the grass arm has been used it can't be used for Again, for another 2d10 days. I like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's, it's, that's it's the stronger. balancing right there. It's, it's very good. And then the, the curse is like the piece of... Yeah, is, I like that. that it, the, the temp HP kind of operates like the halo uh, shield, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, like, you can't stack temporary hit points. So that's 10 HP of buffer that is refreshed per round. Yeah, super mm -hmm. cool. So I'm going to get into the curse before we wrap that up. The, the blade of grass will reappear wrapped around your wrist when you complete a long rest. Each time you use the grass arm after the first, the grassy mass engulfs more and more of your body while <laughs> the effect is active. The fifth time you use grass arm, make a DC 18 wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the grass entirely covers your body and takes control of your mind. You become hostile, Ooh. chaotic, evil NPC under the control of the DM. You retain your stats with these alterations. You per you permanently uh, get the benefit of effects of grass arm, which now applies to all of the limbs. <laughs> the temporary hit points bestowed by this effect are increased to 20 at the start of each turn. Oh, You're considered God. a plant in addition to your normal creature type. Your strength score becomes 24, and your AC can't be less than 18, regardless of what kind of armor you're wearing. Any creature within five feet of you touch it that touches you or hits you with a melee attack takes 2d4 piercing damage. If you are reduced to zero hit points, the controlling effect ends. The sword reverts to its uh, normal bracelet form. Each subsequent uh, time you use grass arm, you must repeat the saving throw to resist being controlled again. 
I love that that Ooh. they give it back to you. They're like, you know, they take over your character, you wreak havoc, they knock you out, and you're like, we can, you can still keep it. You can still keep doing that if you want. I, Disclaimer, <laughs> mechanics represented in this image may change depending on community feedback. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, but, oh, that's so, so good. Ooh, Dungeon Strugglers, yeah, d- it's perfect. <laughs> 10 out of 10. I wouldn't change a thing because that curse drawback hits so hard. It's flavorful. It's dramatic. It's got flair. Ooh, absolutely. It, it forces a condition. It forces, like, a, a detriment that you have to consider, you know? But then, like, yeah, the, the weapon is good in its own. So, yeah. yeah. The weapon in itself is good, but like yeah. if you need to bust out that extra damage and that mm-hmm. protection at the cost of like you know what it could mean for your yeah. character, yeah, it's like totally cool. cool. And they, the, what I love as well is it, it's so accurate to Adventure Time, like, yeah, they got everything dude. In, even like the spikes that hit people if they get too close. Like, that's so good, uh, it, it's just delicious. Like, even if <laughs> I wasn't an Adventure Time fan, like this. <laughs> Oh, it yeah, hit it just right. Yeah, yeah. Especially with all the you know the new stuff at the extra time, Fiona and Cake and all that. I'm glad to, to see. Yeah. I'm it. glad to see you know some more extra time stuff. Yeah. I also like that like you know they made Fiona an adult and like extra thick. Like I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. If people <laughs> ask the tits or ass. I, I say thighs. You know, like holy shit, man. <laughs> Hell yeah, he's cooking, he's cooking. Spear <laughs> the Primal Hunter. Interesting. Ah, damn, that that, that is so fear. fun. I want to see more stuff from Dungeon Strugglers because if yeah. anything else they make is like that, that's going to be boots. amazing. Yeah, I've been following them a while. They've they mm-hmm. got such cool stuff. We're going to have to uh, get them on as an episode. Ooh, now that's a thought. <laughs> Dude, the brainer looks fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that sounds awesome. Bring that on next episode. I'm going to reach out to them and see if we can get somebody on to talk about their homebrew. Oh, yeah, for sure. That'd be awesome. The Uncanny Blade. All right. Yep, they've got one. That's awesome, dude. (laughs) Well, I think that kind of brings us uh, to the end here. Gabe, is there anything that you want to uh, plug, kind of like leave our audience with? I mean, if you want to check out the Ugly Goblin, that'd be amazing. Uh, loads of people joining. It's it's the cool place to be right now. <laughs> and, it is popping. <laughs> I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, uh, I'm on Instagram at uh, Cascando Blue. If you're interested in just checking out artwork that I do. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's me. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been real fun. Thanks for coming. Anybody oh, yeah. listening, please check out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the goblin, check out his fifth age <laughs> PDF. It's not mine. It's not mine. I can't take credit for it. Uh, <laughs> check out the fifth age. <laughs> yeah, I, I did add that to the description while we were talking about that. So that'll be saved on there. Uh, so Probably check out the James Grifford. Check out Dungeon Strugglers. Yeah, that, that's some awesome stuff. And we love some mm-hmm. artwork. So I'm looking forward to checking out some more of that. Mm-hmm. As you've always, been a great guest for the guys. show. You got the vibe. Thank you oh, for thank listening you. to Dungeons and Talk Shows. Thanks for coming to hang with us. Fun conversation. <laughs> uh, and if people want more fun conversations from unhinged fellows like me and Sam, uh, you can just join the Discord server. We got lots of crazy shit going on there. And and a sassy AI that th- seems to think that Goku is her He's wife. Very sassy. Oh, wow. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paka is a sassy bitch. Like, uh, we asked her uh, who would win in a fight, uh, a Waffle House employee or Goku. Well, obviously, she's going to say Goku because she stated many times that Goku is her waifu. Oh, wow. I love it. <laughs> a Waffle House employee. <laughs> yeah, she gave a power scaling a reason, and I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> you, you power scaling Waffle House? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Where else? Well, can have find a good weekend, up? everybody. <laughs> have a good week, everybody. Thanks for watching. All right. Cool. Well.